You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. So silent, holy night, holy now, just calm it down, give me the sunglasses, Danny, all around, mother and child, where's the siblings at? So tender. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful thing, man. I like discovering new things that are awesome like uh, Silent Night by The Temptations. And I want to say thank you to The Temptations for allowing me to, uh, to get in on their album in 1980, before I was born. Appreciate that. I really appreciate that. It's a remastered version, which I mastered. Anyways, Merry Christmas. Probably going to have to keep it a little bit short today, so we'll just call it a no-ad Christmas day, because, I mean, what kind of a Grinch puts ads... Well, you probably heard ads. On the beginning. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really control that. No more, though. That's it. Plus, it's 6.45, and um, it's already kind of late for Christmas Christmas morning. But I did want to uh, at least wish you a very Merry Christmas. And again, like I said, if you got no plans, you can hang out with me, man. Plus, we got Packers today, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a good day. It'll be a good day. Anyways, why, while I got you here, we might as well talk about the upcoming game that's upcoming in, in a matter of hours. So as I mentioned yesterday, they were expecting many people to come back for the Cleveland Browns from the COVID list. From what I can see, five from the COVID-19 list among flurry of roster moves. This is an article via SI.com, Browns Digest. The good news for the Browns, they will have quarterback Baker Mayfield back, uh, Case Keenum, wide receiver Jarvis Landry, cornerback A.J. Green, defensive lineman Efedi Odenigbo, um, unfortunately, the team has also placed kicker Chase McLaughlin and defensive tackle Jordan Elliott on the reserve COVID list. So they brought back five. They lost two more. Um, and of the five that they brought back, Baker is huge. Case is useless because, I mean, Baker is back. And again, like I said yesterday, I don't even know if Case gets the, the gig if whatever. But obviously, Baker is one of the biggest ones, right? Jarvis Landry is relatively big, but I, I, I borderline think that works to our favor. I was more worried to think, now that Jarvis is out, they're going to be pounding their tight ends relentlessly. Relax, it's Christmas. Now that Jarvis is back, I just feel like he's going to be force-feeding Jarvis, and again, he's not, he's not what he was, man. Cornerback A.J. Green, I don't think, really matters. I don't know that he's going to be playing at all. And uh, again, the defensive line group, including Afedio Denigbo, is in desperate need, especially the edge, which is what Odenabo plays, is, I mean, they needed him back for sure, but he is, uh, via PFF grade, their worst pass rusher. So they need him in terms of depth. Maybe. I don't know. We still don't know. Or maybe we do know, but I don't know. <laughs> Let me Google it. Stuff happens when I'm sleeping. Um, I do see that Miles said he, he wants to push through. So again, I, I, I'm assuming he's going to play, but I don't know. No official word as of yet. Let me check Ian. Ian's on the ball. Nothing new yet, but I'll keep an eye on it. Let's see if he said anything about the Packers. I hope not. No news is good news at this point. Nothing since December 19th. What in the world? (laughs) I just said no news is good news. Now I'm mad at him because he hasn't mentioned the Packers in uh, like a week. Hater. Anyways, um, that is it. So as of right now, and we'll check their kicker situation in a minute, it sounds like Jedrick Wills is out, Malik McDowell is out, Troy Hill the corner, Ronnie Harrison, Tony Fields, Mac Wilson, Kareem Hunt, Jadavian Clowney, Greg Newsom, J.C. Treader, 
Chase McLaughlin, and Jordan Elliott. And again, Jordan Elliott is not great because they're already having so many issues um, along that defensive line. Jordan Elliott, one of the worst, I mean, second lowest grade on the team. But in terms of uh, how much he plays, he's actually played quite a bit. 14th most snaps on the entire defense. He is their DT2 on the team. Malik Jackson is the DT1. So as a refresher, their kicker is the guy that's basically 100% as long as it's not a 40-yarder. Between 40 and 49 yards, he's 4 of 10. Um, And apparently he's been having a lot of issues recently. Um, He missed his one attempt this last week. He was 50% the week before that, 50% the week before that, 0 for 1 before that. Um, He hasn't been 100% since week 8. He made 1 of 1. Uh, before that, he missed one in Denver. I mean, he's he's been struggling. And then um, head coach Stefanski came out and was like, Chase is our guy. And two days later, he's on the COVID list. Um, apparently, though, good news kind of for the Cleveland Browns is Chase was so bad, they put a kicker on their practice squad, which is not something I'm familiar with. But they had a guy locked and loaded and ready to go on their practice squad, so he's obviously going to be elevated. The bad news for the Browns, potentially good news for us, although it's kind of a uh, Baker Mayfield situation where this guy's so bad, maybe we want him to be the kicker. But the kind of good news, apparently this is, uh, the kicker's name is Chris Nagar, and I'm going to super enunciate that because I don't want to mess that up. N-A-G-G-A-R. Nagar. It's like Sammy Hagar. His name is Sammy Hagar. That's his name. Chris Hagar. I think the... They messed up that H. It's supposed to be an H, but it kind of slipped at an angle and they put an N on accident. I will forever call him Chris Hagar because I'm not risking this podcast for saying some practice squad kicker's name. Just not going to happen. I'm sorry. Um, apparently, this is Sammy Hagar's first ever NFL action as a kicker. He did kick um, in the preseason week one against the Giants. Um, he was 50%. He made his 30-some-odd yarder. He missed a 50-yarder. So that's that's somewhat understandable. But anyways, he's getting all that action. But at the same time, with the uh, NFL moving the way that it is, and by the way, I hate it. The NFL is, and I've mentioned this before, it's hilarious to me. I remember back in the day when, when I know Madden's still a thing and people play it all the time, but I'm just going to say back in the day because I haven't played it in like 15 years. But I know back in the day, it was a thing that you just kind of never don't go for it on fourth. Like, punting is stupid. I just, you just, you didn't really do it. I remember there was even a commercial way back in the day with John Madden. It was hilarious, by the way. Maybe you remember it. But it was, it was like fourth and 50. And he was inside, you know, his own territory or whatever. And it's just John Madden going, you never go for it on fourth and 50. It's a terrible John Madden, but. You never do that. And the guy's just looking at the camera going, you know, shaking his head with a big smile, just going, yeah, <laughs> like I'm doing this. Same with like two-point converter, you know, all this stuff. It was much more aggressive when you played in Madden because it's like, this is stupid. I'm going to pick it up and all, whatever. And it was always like people who play Madden are stupid and the people who are like NFL coaches are super smart. Now it's like everyone just goes for it on four. How many times have we seen twice now? I want to say in the last two weeks, twice we've seen teams going for it on fourth down in their own territory. And usually it was like, you only did that. I mean, historically until basically this year, from what I've seen, you only do that if it's the last drive and you have no other hope, right? If if if, if it's impossible for you to punt and win, you go for it inside your own territory on fourth. Otherwise, you don't ever do that. And I've seen that twice in the last two weeks. And both times they failed, by the way. But the amount of fourth down, I just, I hate it so much. I hate when other teams do it because I want our defense to just get off. They did a good job. They got them to fourth down. You should get a victory, and now they're going for it again. It's like, don't do it. Come on. I just hate it when a team's like hovering around the 50 because I know now it's four down territory, and our defense, who already allowed them to get this far with only three downs, now has to stop them in four down. So it becomes less likely we stop them, which is makes sense why they do it. I mean, the, the exact logic that makes me upset is also the reason why it's a good idea, but... Then when we do it on offense, it's like, don't, man. When there's, I hate so much when there's points on the board and we don't do it. Um, I think we've been fairly good with that, but I just hate it with a passion. I've probably been wrong more often than I've been right this year in particular, but I, I, I stand by every single time. If we're in field goal range and they go for it, I'm like, I don't like this. I don't. It makes me sick. I'm scared. I just, I, you know, because it's, it's like a momentum thing. It's so awful to do so well 
And I know it's kind of kind of stinks to get a field goal on anything, especially when, I mean, you can have two good drives ended in a field goal and they can wipe it out with a touchdown. So, I mean, there's so many reasons you can look at it and say field goals are stupid, and I get it. But I just hate the idea of an entire drive that gets ruined because you decided to not take points and just, I don't know, I just, I hate it. I hate it. It makes I, I hate it when the when other opponents do it. I hate it when we do it. It's great when we do it and succeed, but otherwise it's always horrible. Even when they do it and we stop it, I love it because we don't, you know, we stop them from getting points, but it's like, okay, cool. We got to start from the four yard line. Great. Thanks. Which again is why you do it. <laughs> it's, I hate that it's such a good idea and it makes sense on every front. I just, the, the, the stress level is already so high in football games. Going for it on fourth, like all the time, constantly going for two point conversions, constantly. Tr- I just, it makes me miserable. Anyways, all that to say, when the with the Browns playing the Packers in Green Bay, going along with the whole every team giving you your best shot, they're probably just going to be going for it a lot anyway. You know, I mean, you know, it's fourth and thirteen with a thirty-five yard field goal. You're going to kick a field goal, but I think they're going to lean pretty heavily towards aggression. Would be my assumption. Hope the Packers bring the aggression. I don't mean going for it on fourth. I just mean violence. Strictly just mean violence. Field eight's just kind of completely mess with me. He says, Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson are st- uh, will start and square off today, marking just the fourth time in the modern era that a number one and number two pick in the same draft will meet as rookie quarterbacks. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you- They're not playing today, are they? They are not. They're playing tomorrow. But anyways, the Green Bay Packers are seven and a half point favorites. Um, it's just one of those games where if the Packers lose, it is... Um, it's going to be relatively monumental. Uh, the Packers don't lose with this kind of a spread. The Packers really very rarely lose at home. I forget what the exact number is. I think it's a, a five and a half point spread or something or high or better. They've never lost. I don't mean histo- I mean I'm talking in the Lafleur era. So I mean we'll 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 see how it goes. They got Baker back. Um, they still have, although it's a they're missing two pieces on that offense or three pieces on the offensive line: the right and left tackle and their center. They still got. Batonio and Teller, who are um, some of the best offensive linemen in football. So the offensive line is not horrible. Um, Baker has flashes of brilliance. Chubb is still a good running back. Um, As I mentioned, Njoku's having a good year. The wide receivers, not super fantastic. As I mentioned, Donovan Peoples-Jones is essentially, I can't say his name and not mention the fact that every time I say his name, I feel like somebody with like a speech impediment. Donovan Peoples-Jones. Peoples-Jones. I don't know. I don't even know what the impediment is. It just, if I feel like, it feels like it's not a real name. That doesn't make sense. It's got to be because there's two plurals, Peoples Jones. But he is grading out as their number one receiver. Again, Landry is actually their number one in terms of who gets targeted the most. Um, but their best receiver so far is uh, DPJ, and he's ranked 67th. So remember, the sort of cheat sheet that I use is if you're top 32, you're technically a number one. If you're top 64, you're in the range of being a number two. Their best is 67th. So they have a high-end wide receiver three as their wide receiver one, except it's not their wide receiver one because they don't throw to him all that much. They throw mostly to Landry, who's ranked 87th. So he's kind of a low-end number three. And I know that's one of those things that everyone's going to freak out. Like, how dare you say Landry's? I'm just, I'm just telling you. I don't know what else to tell you. There are 86 wide receivers that are doing better than him right now. So... You call it whatever you want to call it. Oh, man, what a tease. The Green Bay Packers retweeted Rashawn Gary's tweet, and I can see it. I can see the whole thing. I can see his his logo, his name. It says game day. Hashtag put cheese on everything. Hashtag go pack go. It's Rashawn and Preston. Get loud Lambo. I'm like, dude, did he unblock me for Christmas? And I click on it, and it just says you're blocked. Anyways, um, it looks like looking at our matchup, uh, their offensive line, as I said, they're a little bit banged up. Fortunately, we do get Kenny Clark back. Uh, that's going to help just in general with what the Packers want to do. It looks like MVS is still out, probably not going to be able to play. He's still on the COVID list. But um, the really good thing is, again, their center, J.C. Treader, is out. So Kenny Clark's going head-to-head. So it used to be J.C. Treader, who's a great center, Joel Batonio and Wyatt Teller, the number one and number four guards. That is the most stout and dominant interior that you're going to find. Two of those three are gone. So the interior for Kenny Clark and company just got a lot easier. The only thing that got worse was Preston Smith's matchup against Joel Batonio, who moved from guard to tackle. And again, he's sort of an Elton Jenkins um, 
where we actually, not including David Bakhtiari, but we actually get an improvement when he goes out there. Um, so that's going to be a tough matchup. But they did also lose their right tackle. So Rashawn Gary now goes up against uh, Mr. Blake Hans, and Blake Hans is not a very good tackle. So uh, we got all that working for us. Baker Mayfield does have some wheels, but he's not necessarily blazing fast. So it's not like we can just assume he'll never run on us. But it's going to be a little bit easier for us to um, kind of contain him and get him down. And um, he's kind of in that range of Rashawn Gary can chase him down kind of thing, you know. Rashawn's got some wheels, and he can track some people down from behind. Not necessarily super fast quarterbacks, but I feel like Baker, he's got a shot. And actually, looking at 40 times, he's he's infinitely faster. Let's just say infinitely faster than Baker Mayfield. So yeah, he can, uh, he can track him down. I mean, it, he's really... He's Baker is like uh, it's like Aaron Rodgers, right? He's not afraid to run. He can do it, but he's not a mobile quarterback. Um, I am a little bit excited about the uh, the matchups at wide receiver. Our corners, I think, have done a pretty good job, and there just isn't like a real tough matchup. I mean, I, I don't want to s- massively minimize it because you know anything can happen. But there's always these weird matchups. You know, you go up against Hollywood Brown. Not that he really killed us, but the guy's just got stupid speed. Uh, Andrews, who's just this big hulking. I mean, and Njoku's a big dude, but he's not Andrews. You know, it's just it's just tough when you get these guys who have these unique skill sets, and now you go up against a group, a group of guys that really just don't have those abilities. In fact, DPJ looks like ran a forty at four four eight, which is not fast. He's six foot two, two oh eight, so he's not that big. I mean, in terms of just monster, massive human beings that our guys can't handle, that ain't that big. Richard Higgins ran like a 4.6 something. So he's, uh, let's see if it pops up here. Yeah, 4.64. So he doesn't exactly have speed. He's 6'1, 198. So he ain't big. Um, and then Jarvis Landry's 5'11, 196. Jarvis Landry historically had one of the worst 40 times like ever. <laughs> I think he improved it. But uh, I think at the combine, he ran like a 4.77. And then it says somewhere um, at his pro day, he ran a 4.51, I guess. But. But yeah, at the con- so he ran like a a four six something, and then he sort of improved that. But then at the combine, he ran an official four seven seven. Some of, all his other metrics were some of the like his second lowest broad jump of any wide receiver. So um, obviously he's a talented guy in some respect. I mean he's had a good career, but athletically, there's really nothing that you look at and go, dude, we might just get crushed. We have uber athletic players. So if we if these guys lose, it's not because of athleticism. That's not going to be necessarily the issue. Now, Chandon Sullivan is primarily probably going to be primarily probably, I don't know, Landry's been in the slot a lot up against Chandon. So maybe that's something to be slightly concerned of. But Chandon hasn't really been getting gashed. He's graded out horribly recently and even for the year, 94th out of 117. But it's been pretty quiet. I mean, nobody's really just destroyed him. So I I just, I'm not super worried about that matchup. Um, the only thing I can think is there's going to be a heavy dose of running the ball. Um, I don't know that the Packers have done a fantastic job of shoring that up. We do have Devondre Campbell back, which is great. Going to need guys like Kenny Clark to be able to stack that up. And again, with with having Baker here and not super elite wide receivers, there's nothing I don't think the Packers have to do to get out of their, call it base formation or their base concepts, whatever that might be, um, that's been working all year. I don't think the Browns have anything to force us out of that. Maybe they're going to try. Maybe they're going to try to do what the Brown or the Ravens did last week with Njoku and force them to kind of get us to do other things. But they don't have the mobile quarterback that, you know, we're not going to need a linebacker to stay in and spy him or anything. So we're going to be able to dedicate the resources where it is we want to play. And I think we're just going to play the way we want to play. And it's been stingy for the vast majority of the year. So we'll see. Um... It's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be an easy game necessarily, again, because there's certain things that are just tough to get away from. Uh, primarily, we again, we're going to have to be able to stop the run, which is tough because they have two of the best offensive linemen in football on this offensive line, and Dunn has proven to be pretty solid at left guard. Um, Ninjo, Njoku over here is a good blocker as well as a good receiver, so he's going to be stressing our safeties and linebackers. Um, and, and by the way, Stefanski comes from this same tree. He comes from the same... Um, as, as Matt LaFleur and everything else. So there's going to be similar concepts and similar things to kind of get guys out of position from where they need to be. Um, so, I mean, this this could be a dominant game by the Packers. I hope it is. 
but it hasn't really been that way in a while. The defense has not had a dominant game in a while, and I just I could see this being another scrappy game. On the other side of things, obviously it all comes down to protection. Aaron Rodgers has been fantastic for several weeks now, three, four of his last games. He's just been completely unstoppable. Um, I think one of the biggest things is, well, there, there's there's a couple things. Number one, the ability to run the ball. Uh, Miles Garrett is is the number one thing I'm looking at here, protecting Aaron Rodgers. But outside of that, the, the, the biggest issue for the Packers is having something outside of Devontae. And I think the offense has been clicking because they've had that thing. They've run the ball relatively well, and somebody has stepped up as a receiver or just a collection. You know, maybe it's just one pass to DeGuara, two to Mercedes, two to Lazard, two to MVS, and then a pile to Adams, and a, a bunch to the running backs as well. Or somebody else steps up. MVS has a big day or whatever, but um, with MVS out and Lazard kind of struggling, um, it's going to be hard to win with just Adams. We know that. When it's just Rodgers and Adams. And just looking at the offense, I mean, this is this is a... It's it's not good. I mean, Rodgers is good. Our running backs are good. Adams is number one. Otherwise, we have the 110th ranked wide receiver in Lazard. Winfrey is not even ranked, but he's 43rd uh, is his... Or 43 is his PFF grade. So he's basically dead last if he was ranked. Our left tackle is 56th out of 82. Our uh, left guard is 49th out of 81. Our center is 32nd out of 38. Our right guard is 61st out of 81. Dennis Kelly is not ranked, but he's he got a 53 overall grade, which is basically what Newman and pa- This is This is a, as far as their grade, it's bad, right? <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with run defense more so than pass blocking, or run blocking, I mean, instead of pass blocking. But there is an opportunity here for a defense to really just take advantage of it. Packers have done a great job of mitigating damage and disaster and everything. And again, they they do have really bad interior offense or defensive line, but I said the same thing about the Saints. Almost exact same thing. They've got a really good pass rusher, but this is one of the worst defensive tackle groups in football. Well, we still couldn't push them out of the way for some reason. And part of that might be dedicating extra resources to make sure that we don't take advantage of that. Well, what does that mean? We're going to have to take advantage of them through the air. Well, they've got some pretty good corners. Uh, Greedy Williams is 19th overall. Um, Denzel Ward is ranked 12th overall. They've got, uh, you know, the safeties are a little bit depleted, but the point is we're we're going to have to be able to win. They're not just going to hand us anything. So it's probably like most games where if we don't show up, we're in trouble. We're not just going to automatically win this game. We're going to need somebody else to step up. Either this offensive line is going to have to push people out of the way so we can run, which should be relatively easy to do. Again, they're, they're two top defensive tackles. Um, Elliott, Jordan Elliott, who they just got back, is ranked 114th out of 127th, literally one of the worst. The guy next to him, Jackson, 108th out of 127. They have a 47 and a 45 overall grade, and as best as I can tell, the only other edge rusher next to Miles Garrett is going to be Porter Gustin, and Porter Gustin is not good at anything. As far as our linebackers, JOK is pretty good. Everyone else, not that great. So, I mean, we should be able to push them around. But again, they haven't been able to really push anybody around. And if they can't, what exactly is the plan? So, I mean, it's it's no different than any other game. And I'm not trying to just make everybody scared about this game. It's not about the Browns are super dominant necessarily. It's just you're going to have to have something. There always has to be something. The Packers cannot win if they're one-dimensional. If Rodgers is on and Adams is on... You, you got a shot, but we can't have Lazard continually just dropping balls and just not playing, right? He's not been good enough, period. MVS has been real solid. He's out again. DeGuara has been decent with his one catch a game kind of thing. Mercedes has been pretty solid, but he's good for like two or three receptions a game. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Packers have done a great job up to this point game planning and, and making things work despite all of these weaknesses. Again, I mean, if you just look at this roster, this is... I mean, if I was the... Uh, if I was doing an opposing, if I was a, if this was a Browns podcast and I looked at it, I'd be like, dude, this offense is kind of trash. I mean, Rodgers is Rodgers and Adams is Adams and they got a good couple running backs, but everybody else is garbage. That's, that's the terminology I would use. This offensive line is trash. Their other wide receivers are horrific. Their tight ends are garbage. Well, Mercedes isn't, but they have DeGuara listed as, as the top guy for some reason. I should check the snap counts. I wonder if there's something to that. Yeah. Last week, Josiah did out snap Mercedes Lewis 35 to 31. That's interesting. And the week before, 37 to 36, he outsnapped them. Even before the bye in week 12, it was 35 to 33. I'm wondering how far back I can go, and this has been a thing, and I just was not aware of it. 
Kudos to me for not paying attention. Josiah Aguara, 27 snaps. Mercedes Lewis, 17 in week 11. Has this been all year and I just didn't realize it or what? When did this start? Uh, here we go. Week 10, Mercedes Lewis, 42. Josiah Aguara, 25. After that, since week 10, Josiah Aguara has been our number one tight end in terms of snap counts. Maybe that's just trying to keep Mercedes fresh. Entirely possible. But that's still kind of a big deal. How many times do you think Jace would outsnap <laughs> if he was still here? Uh, Mercedes Lewis. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he would. I don't, it's, anyways, that's interesting. But without trying to be too stupid or cliche, it's really just a matter of the Packers got to show up. And, and listen, Christmas in Lambeau, I just have a hard time believing the Packers are going to come out flat. Maybe they will. I don't know. We know the Browns are going to, you know, give their best shot. So they're going to have to be awake. They're going to have to be fired up. Anything's possible. Maybe Rodgers has a bad day. I don't know. But um, are the Packers the better team? Yes, they are. Should the Packers be able to run the ball against one of the worst defensive line groups in football? Yes. If Miles Garrett doesn't play, is there any excuse for losing this game? Absolutely not. Because regardless of their corners and their you know one good linebacker, this this is without Miles Garrett, this is just a bad defensive unit. At this point, I'm just delaying to get some news that we don't already know. <laughs> we did get this from Adam Schefter, which is pretty crazy. We're 50 days away from the Super Bowl. That feels fake. I guess 50 days is a long time, but not really, right? Halloween was 55 days ago. Doesn't feel like it was that long ago. Just saying. Well, that's all I got for you, folks. It's nothing crazy, nothing super insightful, but I got to get upstairs, start baking some cookies. Hope you guys have a very Merry Christmas. Enjoy your day. Go Pack Go. I'll talk to you tomorrow for hopefully Victory Sunday. Have a good one. Bye.